Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's Word we're going to focus on this morning was our second lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But as we begin, let us pray. The Holy Spirit, your ways are higher than my ways, and your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Elevate our thoughts today to your wisdom through your Holy Word. Amen. Your friends in Christ, Okay, if you have some uh, superb eyesight going on still, you'll notice that on the little bulletin cover, it doesn't just say the great pastor, but it actually says right on top of that really little, in search of, in search of the great pastor. Makes you think, what would be the qualifications you would list for the great pastor? Maybe we could say the ideal pastor. What would that look like? What would that be? One list I ran across went a little something like this. The ideal pastor keeps all of his sermons to under 15 minutes. The ideal pastor, he works for minimum wage, but yet he wears the latest fashions, drives a nice but subtle car, and he gives all his money to church. The ideal pastor, he's 30 years old with 40 years experience, The ideal pastor, he wears a t-shirt, jeans, and a hoodie when he leads worship, exposing his tattoos to let the world know that he has a a past and he's not afraid to share it. But also at the same time, the ideal pastor is clean cut, clean shaven, wears a nice suit, and the proper church vestments of white alb, stole, and cross. The ideal pastor is burning to work with the youth and wants to spend all of his time doing that. At the same time, he visits 15 shut-ins a day, goes out and visits all of the straying members of the congregation and is also knocking on doors every single day to evangelize and save the lost. At the same time, you can always find him in his office. The ideal pastor, right? You know, all those ideas, they come from some of our realistic notions of what we think our pastor should be doing. And if we can take one thing out of this whole ideal pastor scenario, it's just simply that it matters what your pastor does. It truly does. It mattered very much to the Corinthians, whom Paul was preaching to, whom we wrote this letter to. They actually were so enamored with some preachers that they were actually splitting up and, and dividing their loyalty according to the different pastors. They followed them for, for whatever reasons. They followed Paul. They followed this preacher named Apollos. They followed Peter. They followed even Jesus himself. They would say, these are our pastors, and we will not listen to anyone else but these men. And today, you can still see that. We see it very much on a national scale. You see all those preachers out there who have their their very high-rated TV shows. You know people like Joe Osteen, people like Rick Warren, you know people like Mark Driscoll. You know, if you were to use a Wells example, we could say maybe Mark Jeske. He operates a a ministry out of uh, Milwaukee called Time of Grace. And people very loyally follow these men for all different reasons, but mainly because there's something about these pastors that they like. And we'd be remiss if we didn't say the same thing would happen even on the local level within a congregation itself when there's more than one pastor. Sometimes a congregation will side with one pastor over another, whatever the reasons may be, but they choose sides because they like that man so much. In a survey done of uh, people who used to be unchurched, meaning for uh, about 10 years they had not even occasionally attended a church, but then started attending, actually became actively involved, became members of various churches. These people were surveyed, and the survey results you might not find too surprising when 90% of them said the reason why they chose their particular church was because of the pastor. What might be a little bit more surprising, though, is in that same survey, the same people, so you know there's overlap when I say the next number, 88% said it's what the church taught that made them a member of that church. You know, other things were on the list, friendliness of the congregation, the people, relationships, that was about 40%. Music, worship style, that was about 10%. But the point is, even when you talk to people, you understand You can't necessarily take away the two things, the pastor, from what he teaches. In fact, Paul elevates that even to another point. He says it actually is more important 
what the man teaches than the man himself. Paul uses himself as an example. He talked about when he first came before the Corinthians, when he first came to them preaching the very word of God. You know, it says that he came trembling, in weakness, in fear. He didn't come with superior wisdom or eloquence. He was not a man who would start a megachurch. He was not a, a natural born sight to behold. No, in fact, when he probably came up, his, his knees were probably shaking a little bit. He was probably kind of looking over his shoulder as he proclaimed the gospel because he knew that there were people, there were Jews very specifically in Corinth, were told this in the book of Acts, that were seeking to harm Paul. It says they were abusive to him. So every time Paul got up there and proclaimed the message of salvation, of Jesus Christ and him crucified, he always wondered, are the Jews going to be waiting for me after the service? Are they going to be gathering up a mob of people to run me out of town? Are they going to try to, to squash this fledgling little congregation that has started to gather and hear the very words of salvation? He didn't come as a great, dynamic, charismatic preacher whom everyone would just simply love. He came as a simple man proclaiming a simple message in very clear words. And his message was Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Greeks of Corinth called that foolishness. It didn't make sense to them. But the words were easy enough to understand. Paul had laid out there how all of scriptures testify about Jesus, very much what we heard in our gospel lesson, that he came to fulfill all of the scriptures, not to abolish them, not to do away with them, but to show that in every part of scripture, it testifies about him. Not a single part doesn't. And so as Paul proclaimed to them God's plan of salvation, how it all unveiled, how it all carried out, how as imperfect as we are and as unlovable as we were, yet he decided out of his love to come down himself, take on human flesh, to live in our place and to die. That was the message that Paul proclaimed. That's why he said when he came before those Corinthians, when he didn't come with the, the eloquence or superior wisdom, he said, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do your pastors proclaim the same message? Let's be honest. Every Sunday, you should be judging me. You should be judging Pastor Gogger. You should be judging the message that is proclaimed within these walls and asking yourself, what is this man actually saying? Because you may certainly like us. You may get along with us. You may like how we talk. You may not like how we talk. I don't care. What matters is what are we telling you? Are you here and a member of this church because of the pastor? Are you here because somebody has been eloquent with you, because somebody is charismatic enough for you that it makes you want to come back, it makes you feel good? Are you here because we seem so learned, so educated? If these are the reasons why we come back week to week, our salvation is in jeopardy. If we're merely coming to hear somebody talk nice, that's not going to save you. Your very salvation is on the line every time one of us gets up here and says, thus says the Lord. And so judge us. What are we proclaiming to you? Are we proclaiming to you a message of, of eloquence and superior wisdom? Or are we preaching to you Jesus Christ and him crucified? Because that is the message that saves. That is a message of power. 
It's the very one that Paul presented to that congregation, to that Corinthian congregation, because for the specific and sole purpose that their faith might not rest upon the, uh, the wisdom of men, but that their faith would rest on the power of God. If you're like me, I know that I am guilty of judging pastors by a worldly wisdom. That many times I've sat by and how I've critiqued a sermon, how I've picked a message, well, did they engage me? Did they speak to me relevant applications? Did they, did they naturally flow into the sermon? Did I like their structure? Did I like their analogies? And never do I ask, well, did they proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified? If your salvation were to depend on my eloquence, God save your souls. <laughs> Truly. I am not eloquent enough, I am not wise enough to save you by how I talk. The reason we get up here and proclaim to you week in and week out a message of Jesus Christ is because this is the only message that saves people. This is the only message that carries with it the power of the Holy Spirit which works into our hearts, whether we realize it or not, but that He is actively affecting us as we hear about this salvation history proclaimed to us again and again in different ways. We aren't broken records. We aren't incapable of thinking of new ways of telling the same story. We proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified because this is the the only message that works. The only message that brings people to faith. That's it. It's not about how eloquent we are, how, how cute we make the sermon themes, how good the stories are. It's about Christ. And amazingly, when you think about Christ, everything comes back together and makes sense. We know we're guilty of judging pastors by a worldly standard, a worldly set of wisdom that would simply say their eloquence or their charisma or their pulpit presence, that is what makes a good pastor when really it mattered more about what they said. See, even Jesus himself, he didn't come into this world with eloquence and superior wisdom. He came in such a way that Isaiah described him that nobody would be attracted to him Isaiah wrote, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Like one from the whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jesus Christ did something differently, though. It wasn't the showmanship that attracted people to him. It was the very power of God. He spoke as someone with authority, proclaimed, this is what the Lord says. And he explained the scriptures to people. The very ones he said, these are the scriptures that testify about me. And all the while, he heard the same judgments that we make, judgments of worldly wisdom. And he just simply absorbed it all. He took on them all. All the times where we would judge him, well, he doesn't look like that great of a public speaker, or he didn't really engage me today, he didn't really, you know, kick it into gear for me. But that's why Christ preached the way that he did. To remove from us the guilt of that sin. To make us perfect again. Through his substitutionary life. See, not only did Christ be this preacher, not of, of eloquence or superior wisdom, but he even told us that something else has changed in us as well. He says that he has given to us the very mind of Christ. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. When we have this gift of the Holy Spirit, it's nothing, it's nothing you don't already have. It's the very thing that he has given to you when he brought you into his family, when he brought you to faith. It changes you. It actually changes your way of thinking and how you approach it. It changes you from looking at a pastor and saying, 
well, is he engaging me today? Is he telling me great stories? Is he someone I can get behind? To, is he giving me a divine feast of the grace of God? Is he proclaiming to me my salvation and unfolding and applying it to me so that I know that without a doubt Jesus Christ is my Savior, that he has lived for me and died for me, and because of that, I belong in the kingdom of God. Because with this mind of Christ, that is what we look forward to. That is what we're looking at in each and every single one of the messages presented here within the church. That all of our pastors will proclaim that same message like Paul, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because that is what changes us. That's what builds us up. That keeps us in His kingdom. So if you're ever thinking about the ideal pastor, wondering what he looks like, what he sounds like, you know that your minds have changed about the criteria. No longer are we going to judge the pastors by worldly wisdom, but God's wisdom. Are they proclaiming to me Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Because our faith rests on God's power and not men's wisdom. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.